are not going to like this, but there was a clear and unexpected villain of this series. Or as they would say, seaweed. Yeah, I hear the outrage already, but I watched every single episode. You can only debate with me if you watched all 62 episodes in 2023. And I know you didn't, because why would you? Butt lovers. If you are familiar with the line, the phone, the phone is ringing, or what's going to work? Teamwork. I'm sorry to break this news to you, but TikTok thinks we're old. Welcome back to the Lore series where we discuss shows and commercials that one time and only that one time, maybe I'll do another one one day, that no one else is brave enough to. As always, though the shows I talk about are intended for kids, my videos are not. My videos are for nostalgic and quite frankly weird as shit people around my age or older. So don't bring little Timmy and Tabitha over to the computer screen because I'm not babysitting them. Wonder Pets won in the latest community tab post and it's no wonder. <laughs> Its unique look is both a product of its time and ahead of its time at the same time. Created by Josh Setlick, who also created Ubi, which eventually I'll cover, Nickelodeon's Wonder Pets aired from 2006 to 2016, despite what Google will have you believe. The release of this show is so confusing because some sources say it ended in 2016, which is correct, and some sources say it ended in 2013. That's a big difference. Where is this confusion coming from? I only found the answer when looking through my new favorite website, TV Tropes. Quote, the show had three seasons and wrapped production in 2010 but its broadcast history is highly unusual. It began in 2006 and aired most of its third season on Nickelodeon in 2009 to 2010. After that, the show was moved to the Nick Jr. channel, where there were two new episodes in 2011, three in 2013, one in 2015, and three in 2016. In other words, it took them five years to air the last nine episodes, and they didn't even release anything in 2012 and 2014. It's a strange timeline to follow, so no wonder... <laughs> The information about it is all over the place. Now that that's cleared up, what are we looking at? This show is animated by manipulating photos of real animals. This is called photo puppetry, and I fail to think of another series that does it this well. Although many of the creatures they save are also made from photos, many objects are drawn in a variety of styles. So on top of photo puppetry, the show would also be considered mixed media. So think Amazing World of Gumball or Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. One thing that also amazes me about the medium they chose is that for the most part, they pulled it off in a cozy and non-creepy way. I mean, it's surreal for sure, but it doesn't hurt to watch watch. I seriously can't think of another example that used photo puppetry this effectively. Let me know in a comment below if you can think of anything else, because I definitely want to see more of this. Something else that's notable about the production is that each episode is accompanied by a 10-member live orchestra. I completely forgot how musical this series is. Almost all the dialogue is sung, so while there are a lot of recurring songs, there are many originals as well, from a little jingle about the lesson Linny taught them, to music that embodies whatever place they're visiting. So for example, when they visited New York City, there was a jazzy, broad Broadway vibe, and as the series progressed, they also did more on-the-nose parodies of specific groups. Weird observation time, this era of young children's cartoons was very music-centric. We have Nickelodeon's Wonder Pets and Backyardigans to Disney's Little Einsteins, to name a few, and these were all very intentional in how they used music to further educate. Whether talking about the actual composers of classical works, or the cultural impact art has within a community. I know I'm beyond biased and probably not searching deep enough, but are there any cartoons that are coming out today with that level of detail in the music for baby shows? Because the more I think about it in my eyes, that was like a golden age for developmental TV shows. I know we still have Sesame Street, which is great, and I've heard amazing things about Bluey, but I hope this detail and care won't be stripped away with AI and Coco Melon. The format of most of the episodes goes as follows. They slowly zoom into the preschool building and then we see the title card, which looks as though a student created it. We hear a voiceover of the student announcing the name of the episode. And the beginning of the episode is actually the end of the school day. We hear all the students saying goodbye to the class pets, Linny, Tuck, and Ming Ming. And sometimes they also briefly mention to their parents what they learned during the day. This is all heard but not seen. Almost immediately, as soon as everyone leaves, this can on a string begins to ring. They call it a phone, but teach their own. Now those accidental bars are nothing compared to the phone. The phone. Now this can is honestly very advanced tech. It alerts the group of an animal in trouble. It's a video call and the elements can travel through it. So for example, in the very first episode, Save the Dolphin, there's a splash of water that travels through the phone. So it's more like a little FaceTime portal. After they exclaim the stakes of the situation, aka how serious it is, they jump in a box of different costumes exclaiming, Wee! which is honestly just too fun and a little accurate. Oh my God, he's on fire. He's gonna literally die. We gotta, we gotta help him. Whee! 
After that, they play a tiny game of dress up as if an animal isn't about to meet God. And finally, they build the fly boat, which is made up of a frisbee, some wheels, the marker caps. Oh my God, I love the marker caps as exhaust pipes detail. We see them assemble most of it, but we never see where those gears and lights come from at the bottom. Maybe that's why they Ooh. every single time. Like they're amazed themselves. How did, how did we do this? And somewhere along the way prior to them leaving, they face a mini problem, which helps them with the main problem of the episode. They then skedaddle on out of there to the tune of one of their other original bops. <laughs> And then the animal is saved, obviously. So where's the lore? Where do we go from here? We will be talking about the humans and how aware they are of these animals' secret double life. We will be talking about the unfortunate possibility of this being all in their minds, which, listen, I hate theories like that. They just suck the magic and life out of everything. But I can't ignore it, unfortunately. There's too many little hints. But first and most importantly, the drama is like that of a reality TV show. The overarching beef between Tuck and Ming Ming is truly outstanding. It never got any better and quite frankly, I don't even think they're friends. Is everything okay, you two? Fine. All of Tuck and Ming Ming's problems stem from Ming Ming being the goddamn worst. There, I said it. I know she's supposed to be snarky and I know she's the youngest which makes her the most prone to making mistakes. But after a while, these excuses don't justify her behavior. Namely because there is no growth. And in fact, I'd say the last episode episode of the series is the worst one. Whew, I'm getting ahead of myself. In Save the Caterpillar, no one was safe. She mocks Tuck for walking too slow. She mocks Linny when she compliments Tuck. Good eye, Tuck. Good eye, Tuck. I heard that. <laughs> In Save the Hermit Crab, Ming Ming is annoyed when they have to save somebody on their vacation. In Save the Pirate Parrot, Tuck goes to hug Ming Ming and Ming Ming dodges it, totally sidesteps him. In the Christmas episode, Save the Reindeer, Ming Ming breaks Tuck's present and then when they're going to save the animal, she's annoyed that she didn't open hers yet. Linny was the true moral compass of this episode, giving up her own gift in order for Santa's reindeers to fly. I thought this would inspire Ming Ming to give her present to Tuck since she destroyed his, but that never happens. And this is something you'll see a lot of. Ming Ming never actually apologizes in a meaningful way. And in fact, she breaks his shit again in Save the Platypus. She barged into his cage uninvited, ruined his stuff, and then was insulted when he didn't want to talk to her. And Tuck was somehow still the one that by the end of the episode, he had to salvage their friendship because he had to talk to her for the mission, even though she never apologized prior. It's always two steps forward, four steps back with Ming Ming. She's such a little shit. And she even acknowledges this fact. That's right, Ming Ming has self-awareness about being the worst, which makes her even worse in my eyes. In the episode Kalamazoo, while she's looking after her little cousin Marvin, who's making her life more difficult, she says, quote, you remind me of me unfortunately. In the episode Save the Bengal Tiger, a fly tried to talk to Ming Ming and she went full diva on the poor thing, exclaimed singing, we're big important heroes with hero stuff to do and you're just a tiny whiny bug so shoe fly shoe. And admittedly, well, that's kind of fire. She should be fired for saying that shit. So Linny and Tuck were obviously like, dude, why'd you do that? That's so uncool. Fuck you, you're off the team. Not, not that last part. And the worst part is how this lesson was dealt with because it was resolved in a second when Ming Ming saw that even a tiny fly could be useful. I hate that. I hate that. And here's why. It's supposed to be empowering, but it's totally backwards from my own values. I give people respect until they prove to me that they don't deserve it. Not the other way around. Not don't give respect until they earn it, which is kind of what this episode is implying. In a job well done, Ming Ming claims to be Linny's favorite, which clearly bothers Tuck. It isn't always easy being Linny's favorite. That's not true. Yes, it is. And in the last episode that aired, Save the Genie, each of the Wonder Pets gets a wish. Tuck wishes to hug everything. Aww. Linny wishes that there was celery growing everywhere she went. Yeah. And Ming Ming wishes for two servants. I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating, and those were her exact words. I went to loyal servants who tend to my every whim. A what? She wished for servants and she treated them terribly. <clears throat> I am seeing grapes, but I am not tasting grapes. Oh, sorry, your majesty. She's more than just an asshole. She's a full-blown tyrant. I'm over this duckling. I wish she would just give one flying fuckling. So now you know my feelings on Ming Ming. Tuck is just a big old softy who's constantly bullied by Ming Ming, as we've seen. But what about Linny? Let me just tell you something. I am a Linny stan. I am always the most critical of characters that are supposed to be the leaders 
because I feel like most of the time they come across as very arrogant, very bossy and demanding, but Linny doesn't come across like that at all. She effortlessly leads, not because she proclaimed herself as leader, but because the other two are just such huge followers. They are desperate for her approval, even asking permission to do basic things. Can I wail into space, Linny? Sure you can, Ming Ming. Can I take a shit, Linny? Sure, Tuck. Yes! Best boss ever! It's not out of fear, they just adore her. And I don't blame them. In Save the Love Bugs, Tuck and Ming Ming are waiting for Linny to give them a valentine. What's interesting about this is Tuck and Ming Ming give Linny a valentine, but Ming Ming and Tuck do not give each other valentines. I love you. Aww. We love you too, Linny. Linny is the glue of this group and the only reason Tuck and Ming Ming tolerate each other. This is joked about in the episode Save the Duckling and Save the Turtle. In one episode, Ming Ming's in trouble and in the other one, Tuck is in trouble. And both Tuck and Ming Ming made the joke, isn't it nice just the two of us, Linny? It's kind of nice when it's just you and me. How many? Tuck, we're saving Ming Ming. I know. Isn't this nice, Linny? Just you and me. Ming Ming, we're saving Tuck. Personally, I just think these two have more moments where they're taking jabs at each other than actually enjoying each other's company. One of the few times Ming Ming and Tuck were on the same page is in the episode Join the Circus. It's summer break and Linny explains to Tuck and Ming Ming what summer break means, meaning Linny is the only veteran to this preschool lifestyle. Oh. So since it's summer, Ming Ming and Tuck want to try a new job out. And Linny goes along with it because she loves her friends, even though she's miserable. All she wants to do is save other animals. She's nothing but smiles when they're around, but she broke down the moment she was alone, crying and sniffling. And it, it absolutely broke my heart. In a hole or in a tree, and we are the Wonder Pets, a saving family. Dude, shut up. Why am I crying? She sometimes needs to rely on people too, okay? And she always has to pretend everything's fine when it's not. I wish she wasn't G-forced into being perfect all the time. The origin story episode entitled How It All Began confirmed all of my suspicions. Linny being the first classroom pet confirmed they didn't drop those hints for nothing. George R.R. R. Martin is quaking. Tuck was next and he was left on the doorstep of the preschool. Tuck and Linny became friends and sometime after that, the classroom got a new pet in the form of an egg. The egg hatched, out pops Ming Ming, just as annoying as ever, and Tuck basically said, I don't like her. I don't want to be friends with her. And Ming Ming's like, I feel the same way about you too, buddy. Fight, 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 fight. Their rivalry was fresh out of the gate, like, like immediately, which confirms that the foundation of their friendship is just tolerating each other for Linny's sake. I'm not your dad and she's not your mom. He's right. What? Despite being classroom pets, they all have families. Linny has her grandma Ginny in a retirement home and grandma Winnie as well. I didn't realize these were two different people. Ming Ming has her aunt Eleonora and cousin Marvin in a petting zoo in Kalamazoo. And most confusingly, Tuck's cousin Buck. I say most confusingly because in the origin episode, we saw that Tuck was left on the doorstep. So I don't know how these two reunited later in life. And if I was Tuck, I would wish that we didn't at all because Buck in his one and only appearance did not do himself justice. He was a douchebag that both Ming Ming and Linny were swooning oh over God, despite him treating Tuck like ass terribly. Stepping away from the Real Housewives Vanderpump rules of it all to finally say, do the humans know how intricate the lives of these animals are? The answer is either yes or they are the worst pet owners ever because here's the thing, every school break that is seen, they leave the pets there. None of the kids or adults ever take the wonder pets or even visit just to feed them over these breaks. They are completely alone as seen in the episodes Save the Reindeer, Save the Hermit Crab, Kalamazoo, Save the Nutcracker, Join the Circus, and Help the Easter Bunny. On top of just leaving the pets with no one to care for them, in the episode Save the Old White Mouse, one of the preschool children asks, will Linny be back tomorrow? And the teacher replies with yes. How does she know though? Do they talk with Linny? Does Linny request days off? Or does she just leave the cage and all the adults assume she ran away? Another strange thought that occurred to me as I was watching this specific episode is, is this nursing home just for animals or is it for humans and animals? Because even though we only saw an old guinea pig, an old mouse, and an old frog, all the furniture is way too big for them, so I'm gonna assume it's a nursing home for old animals and old humans. That end, when Linny was explaining what a nursing home was, she explained that older people lived there and held up this photo of literal humans. So yeah, it's probably both. This is not the case for other places which seem exclusive to animals, like in the episode Save the Cool Cat and the Hip Hippo. In this episode, the Wonder Pets travel to Greenwich Village to visit an animal jazz club, which in their words, is a place where animals from all over come to sing and play. And that's also accompanied with these pictures. For 
further confirmation that the humans have to know that the animals have their own society. That is if the humans are even real. Yeah, I was playing around with the fact that the humans were unseen, but that actually changed from season two onward. In the episode Save the Pangaroo, the title card is accompanied by this live action child walking up to it and adding her drawing. And also in the episode Save the Bee, we see this. I'm a bee. And for whatever reason, that was a jump scare and a half to me. Because for so long, they were just heard. So now that we're seeing them, it feels like a fever dream. Like, imagine you're watching Peanuts, and you're just hearing all the <laughs> of the adults. And then the camera pans around, and you see an older, more depressed-looking Charlie Brown with gray hair, and ah. A theory that I was avoiding for a while, because I hate it, is that this is all imagined. And while I semi-believe this to be true, it's not in the way that you'd think. Because while it would be so easy to say that this is how the kids imagine the pets to act after they leave school, the world is so intricate and it takes place over at least two years. So we're not even following the same group of unseen kids. So for me personally, it doesn't make sense to give that kind of storytelling power when the show only starts when they leave. And it always seems like they have stuff going on afterwards too, like, oh mom, can we go to the park today? I don't think they're thinking about the pets that, that much. If this is all imagined or mostly imagined, I think it's imagined by the Wonder Pets themselves. Like we are seeing the Wonder Pets playing pretend. One sequence that really brought this to life was in the episode Save the Turtle. This was the episode where Tuck needed to be saved, but how he got in the situation was really strange. He started singing in the classroom about how he wanted to travel to the ocean. And as he's singing, we start to see visuals of him swimming in the ocean. And since this was in the midst of his I Want song, it seemed like he was daydreaming. Not that he was actually there. But then he got stuck in coral and called for help. When Linny and Ming Ming answered the call for help, it was revealed that he was in the Caribbean. How? How? How did he get there? With the power of his mind? That's literally just called imagining. That plus the fact that where they go and who they save always coincides with what the kids are learning about and how the classroom is decorated. In the episode Save the Pangaroo, the fictional creature of a pangaroo that a kid designed fell into the trash. To save the pangaroo from loneliness, Aww. the Wonder Pets drew a half butterfly, half deer for the pangaroo to befriend. This is further confirmation that the Wonder Pets literally just want to participate in the lessons and the activities that the preschoolers are doing throughout the day, but have to wait until they leave to do so. Plus, every time they leave the school, they're going in the same direction for the same amount of time. And this isn't entirely to save animation, because a lot of the time the flyboat is designed differently with new elements or a totally different base. Sometimes they're wearing different outfits, or they're singing a different song, or Ollie's with them. More on Ollie later. These tiny variations make me think it would be so easy to insert a time-lapse scene, and maybe Ming Ming going, Are we there yet? But that never happens. They always get to these faraway countries like that. Like that. Like, like that. Wow. Ew. All of this, along with the fact that Linny winks at us at the end of almost every episode, makes me think that this is just a game. Maybe a game to keep this unstable trio of friends, which is really just two friendships forced together, to stay together. Just so you know, if I didn't say it enough, I hate this theory. I don't like throwing imagination out there because it's such a fix-all for everything. However, look at this short pilot and tell me if you truly believe Linny went to space. It's escapism is what it is. And I haven't even gotten into the trippiest parts of the show yet either. There are many episodes that don't even take place in their world. One of the first examples of this is in the episode Save the Unicorn, where they jump into a book that the students were reading. There we see that the animation is distinctly different for fictional creatures. The unicorn isn't an edited photo of a real horse, it's just cartoony, really driving the point home that this is a different reality. In the episode Save the Dinosaur, they do have a photorealistic dino, and even though it looks really creepy and, and not very good in my opinion, it makes sense why they did this. Dinosaurs aren't fictional. The Save the Dinosaur episode also confirms that they're just making shit up as they go, because when they didn't know how to get to the baby triceratops, they just fly at full speed at the dinosaur poster because they're like, ah, it's worth a shot. To the land of ass I go! They jump in a coloring book to save a flamingo. They jump in a sumier painting to save a crane. They even jump into the puppet theater of the classroom, which they call Puppet Land in the episode Save the Three Little Pigs and Save Little Red Riding Hood. They established Puppet Land as the land of fairy tales as we also saw Goldilocks while we were there. Why am I getting deja vu? Hip, hip, hooray. 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 Another 
other world that they established in more than one episode is in the pop-up book that they call Mother Gooseland. They visit Mother Gooseland in the episode Help the Cow Jump Over the Moon and Save Humpty Dumpty. But unlike in Superwise version of the nursery rhymes where it's just a mystery, Wonder Pets established right away that each of these stories are like a job. Ever heard of it? Ming Ming was confused that the cow who jumps over the moon was having a hard time doing that because isn't that all she does? But the cow in the story explained that that was the old cow and this is her first day on the job. I'm so glad they cleared up this world within a world because that's the only thing that makes sense in the canon of Wonder Pets and in my life. What am I doing? What am I talking about? Another distinctly different medium is in the clay diorama world which we've seen in Save the Mermaid, Save the Pirate Parrot, and Save the Monster. Not only is it fun to see this mixed media utilized in this way, but it also brings the classroom more to life. As a kind of connoisseur of TV shows that totally aren't made for me, I have to say I prefer these episodes because these worlds have more freedom and don't have any strange implications. For example, in the episode 3 Wonder Pets and a Baby, there's just a baby piglet in the classroom. This isn't in a storybook or anything, this is in their world. And obviously I'm wondering why. Why is there a baby piglet in the classroom? PETA would have a field day with the show. Now this isn't the only time they have strange visiting animals. A bunny named Ollie is a recurring character, for better or for worse. And in the episode Here's Ollie, he invites the Wonder Pets over to his house for a sleepover. So we see that Ollie lives in the wild, like in a hole underground with his family, right outside the school. Linny even called him their neighbor. This is bananas to me, because this means canonically, this preschool just captures a wild bunny to bring inside with a group of kids and, th and that's just a totally normal thing. Like before this episode, I just assumed that he was one of the kids' pets, but no. He's a totally undomesticated wild rabbit who probably has rabies. Confusing world aside, let's get back to the reality TV-esque drama of the Wonder Pets where interpersonal interspecies conflict is the realest part. What's gonna work? Group therapy, because Linny can't be the only one holding this bitch down forever. Ollie's introduction was in the episode Save the Skunk, and I immediately remembered that this bunny annoyed the crap out of me when I was younger. And upon this rewatch, I realized that that was an intentional choice of the writers. He's impatient, he's rude, he keeps calling Linny pig instead of guinea pig, which annoys her, and it annoys me too because I'm a ride or die for Linny. We don't tolerate Linny disrespect here. In the episode Ollie to the Rescue, we see that this dude just wants to be Linny so badly. This time he's not even tagging along with the Wonder Pets, he's bringing his own group that he calls the Thunder Pets, where it's just him, a toy frog, and a rock. This is Penny, and Chip, and say hello to you, Napkin. The only good thing about Ollie, other than his design, quite frankly, being cute as shit, I mean, I can't deny it, is that Ming Ming Sass is the most endearing when it's targeted at him. Throughout all of his appearances, she's just like, are you shitting me? I don't want to hang out with this loser, which is valid. Next up, fun fact, actually really, really sad fact. Like this video if you like fruit and you think I'm annoying as fuck. This has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's really funny and want to talk to you about it. So if you don't know who Tila Dunn is, she's the voice actor for Tuck, and she's also an influencer. I have nothing against her. Her career just took a very interesting 180. Think Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball We Can't Stop era. The only difference is I can see Hannah Montana doing everything Miley Cyrus did to separate herself from Disney, but I just can't see Tuck locking lips with Jake Paul or having beef with Tana Mojo Jojo. I can picture Ming Ming doing all that shit, but Tuck? Look at all these tweets of people in absolute shock that Tila Dunn is Tuck. I'm in this weird place because I understand, but... Why are we shocked? Noah Cyrus is the voice of Ponyo, and then she grew up and, and did stuff like this. Smelling your forehead. And it both makes sense and doesn't. It makes sense in the fact that these people aren't the characters they play, but we feel so entitled to not have our cute shows associated with anything cringy or weird or inappropriate. But there is no way to avoid this. All right, eight-year-old child actor, you got the job, which is already ethically iffy. Now do you swear to not kiss anybody cringy or problematic when you're older? Time to mention some weird references sprinkled throughout the series. So in the episode Save the Beatles, there is a band of Beatles who are stuck in a yellow submarine in Liverpool. Oh boy, I can just imagine a dad watching this with their kid and being like, <laughs> you don't even know this reference. Let me show you some music from the real band. Holy shit, Dad, I don't care. Can you just let me watch my show? Also, they make a joke about how they love jelly beans, and this went right over my head until I did a bit of research. So apparently in an interview, one of them said that their favorite candy is jelly babies, which looks almost like Sour Patch Kids. They're gummy and soft. Anyway, Americans being how we are completely misinformed 
misinterpreted it and resorted to violence. Just full-blown assault, with American fans lovingly pelting jelly beans at the Beatles, which are much harder and they got hurt as a result. Really weird thing to reference in a Wonder Pets episode of all places, but that's not even the weirdest of it. The episode Save the Fiddler Crab on the Roof was an obvious homage to Fiddler on the Roof. I don't know how to feel about this and quite frankly my opinion doesn't matter that much, but the subject matter and historical context of that show is so serious and depressing, I don't know why they chose to do this. In the episode Save the Vixen, there's a Casablanca reference. And lastly, in the episode Save the Hound Dog, aside from there being Elvis references all over the place, the animation style of the dog just made no sense to me. Apparently, this is an animal in their world. Usually, this more cartoony style is exclusive to them jumping in books. Up until this point, the stylistic visual choices were really consistent, so this just, this really confuses me. Speaking of randomly switching things up, in the episode Save the What, the episode opens with the phone being broken. For such a high-tech tin can, detecting all possible danger from across the world, all it took to break was a little dent. The weirdest part is that in this episode, the Wonder Pets address us directly for the first and only time. Will you be a Wonder Pet today? I thought you'd never ask! Just imagine it flowing in the back. But anyway, it's so out of left field, even for this show. It feels like a Nickelodeon exec came up to them and was like, Hey, you know how Dora talks to the viewers? Can you randomly sprinkle that in? in the middle of this series where that never happened before. Imagine the poor kids that like the passive nature of this show. Ah, uh, if there's one thing I hate, it's when cartoon characters try to talk to me. <laughs> like, stay in your lane! Anyway, let me watch my favorite show that never does that, The Wonder Pets. Hey! No! Maybe you can help us. They've never done that before! Will you be a Wonder Pet today? I don't want to work! Now before we wrap up, I've been dodging a major aspect of this show. The celery propaganda. Last I checked, I hate celery and it's one of the worst vegetables. However, 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 big celery has a chokehold on this show and therefore naturally I have to retry it to see if it's any good because I haven't had it in years. True story, I bought celery just for this video. A tax write-off if I ever did see one. But I forgot and then I saw it in my fridge and was like, ew, who bought celery? Me, I did. Do I have to peel it? What do I even have to do? Oh, 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 fuck, I hate it. Ew, uh, it's worse than I remember. Oh my god, ew. Okay, swallow it. Oh god, what a terrible way to end a lore video. But I sure hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe if you did. We are heading towards 100k and I'm so, so excited. Let me know what you want to see me cover next and be sure to check out my Jack Soames collab if you haven't already. All right, have a great day, butt lovers. Bye! Do any of you like celery? Like, do you guys fucking want this?